would like to welcome you to our Krasno Global Event Series tonight. Thank you very much for your interest and for joining us today for our event on the politics of Henry A. Kissinger, wise and visionary or reckless and evil. I just noticed that someone uh, signed in with the name Henry. So I was wondering, maybe the man himself has just joined us. As many of you will know, German-born Henry Kissinger fled to the United States with his parents in 1938. He became a professor at Harvard in the early 1950s, and Kissinger was President Nixon's national security advisor and then Secretary of State under both Nixon and President Gerald Ford. Kissinger's policies in the Vietnam War and toward many Latin American countries, such as Chile, have been most controversial. His detente policy towards the Soviet Union and the opening to China were also most disputed at the time, but they have been looked upon much more favorably since then. Kissinger's policies towards the European allies and the 1973 Middle East War and his Middle Eastern shuttle diplomacy have also caused great dispute, but they have also gained great praise from some. His almost single-handed decision, while Nixon was indisposed and sleeping upstairs in the White House, Kissinger's decision to put the country and much of the world on a nuclear alert in late October 1973 frightened many people. Since the 1970s, Kissinger has stayed in the limelight with the help of his consultancy, which made him a rich man, and the publication of many opinion pieces and the publication of many books, including his three of, uh, massive volumes of memoirs. On May 27, 2021, Kissinger will be 98 years old and he is still very much in the middle of the national debate on China, Russia, and many other issues. It is a great pleasure to welcome our three special guests today who have all written big books and articles about Henry Kissinger. Professor Thomas Schwartz joins us from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Professor Bernd Greiner joins us from Berlin in Germany. And Professor Barbara Kies joins us from the University of Durham in the UK. And as always, I'm happy to join you from Chapel Hill in North Carolina. And tonight, today it's uh, unfortunately a little gray in uh, Chapel Hill. I'm Klaus Laris, and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina here in Chapel Hill. I've been organizing the Krasno Global Event Series since 2012, and we are still going strong. As you know, the Krasno Event Series at UNC always deals with issues of global concern. We have a great website, krasnoevents.com, and we have a popular YouTube channel, and I would like to invite you to watch that YouTube channel and perhaps become a subscriber. The address is youtube.com slash krasnounc. And please sign up for our mailing list via the website or simply by sending me an email. Tonight, each of our guests will talk for no more than 10 to 12 minutes, and I will then ask them a few questions before we open it up to questions from you, the audience. As always, please submit your questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our excellent two Krasno assistants today, Anna Fiore and Pete Velasmil, they will select the questions and read them out aloud. There are usually so many questions, so many interesting and provocative questions. Unfortunately, we cannot answer them all, but we will do our best. Please mention your name and your location when writing down a question. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to our Krasno event at UNC on the politics of Henry A. Kissinger, wise and visionary or reckless and evil. And our first speaker tonight is Professor Thomas Schwartz. Tom and I go back many years and I'm pleased to report that Tom Schwartz was already one of our Krasno speakers in January 2014. Tom is a distinguished professor of history and political science at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. He has just uh, published the much praised book, Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political, a political biography. In this book, he deals with all of Kissinger's life and career from the 1920s to the very present. Tom is also the author of many other acclaimed books, such as America's Germany, John McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany, which came out with Harvard in 1991. And, he also, and the book also received the Bernard Book Prize. And he also wrote Lyndon Johnson and Europe in the Shadow of Vietnam, which came out in 2003. 
And he also co-edited a book I found very useful in my own work entitled The Strained Alliance, US-European Relations from Nixon to Carter, Cambridge University Press, 2009. Tom has held many prestigious fellowships and has received multiple prizes for both his writings and his teaching. It is a great pleasure to welcome Tom Schwartz tonight to the Krasno event series. Today, Tom will enlighten us about Kissinger's detente policies and many other aspects of Kissinger's life and work. Over to you, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Klaus. Um, I'm particularly grateful to Klaus. Um, I have been a previous uh, uh, speaker, so this is my second opportunity to, to do a Krasno talk. Um, I have a particular attachment to UNC, having had three of my daughters go through there and love it, and I've enjoyed my uh, connection to UNC over the years. I want to thank also uh, my fellow participants, Berndt and Ara. Ara must be getting a little tired of this. She's done it before for me as well as a commentator. And I want to thank Anna and Pete for um, moderating and handling the questions. I will try to stick to my 10 minutes. Um, I tried to prepare and be careful and I have a little timer here to, to keep on this. I know it's a uh, 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 as someone who suffers Zoom fatigue quite frequently, I know that this is one of the challenges of doing so. So let me just say a few words about the origins of my book, because I think it's important in, in explaining how I came about it. The book originated in a series that Helen Wang, uh, which is an Arma Farr and Strauss, the publisher, uh, was trying to use, uh, the proposal in the uh, original series was to use biography. Uh, the biography of a significant individual as a way of telling a larger historical story. So stories particularly, uh, for example, one of the first books in this series used the biography of Pocahontas to tell a story about Native American history. Um, I accepted that, or I proposed uh, Henry Kissinger as a way to talk about American foreign policy uh, in the 20th century. That, uh, in effect, using Henry Kissinger as a way to get across an argument and theme about the nature of American foreign policy. Why Kissinger? Well, that was, that was a question initially. Why not someone like uh, Dean Acheson, Truman Secretary of State, George Ball, the uh, diplomat under Johnson who opposed the Vietnam War, John Foster Dulles, who dominated the 50s? I kept coming back to Henry Kissinger. Um, he's led a remarkable life, and it's a life connected to all, I think, the key issues of the, in the making of American foreign policy. It is literally some 70 years now since his name first appeared in the New York Times in 1951 as the coordinator of a seminar uh, with European uh, 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 diplomats and others that would be taking place at Harvard. It is more than 60 years that he has been a national commentator. Even today in the Wall Street Journal, there is an op-ed in which Kissinger participates on the issue of nuclear weapons and the, the uh, he is with uh, uh, William Perry and Sam Nunn, two other prominent uh, American figures, Secretary of Defense and a Senator, in talking about the need to develop more restrictions on nuclear weapons. So this is a man who's had an extraordinarily long, varied career, controversial to be sure, but certainly uh, in its length uh, and breadth, um, something very unusual in American history. I also sought to be, um, uh, before uh, Fox News corrupted the phrase, fair and balanced. Um, I wanted to avoid either the hagiographic treatment that Kissinger received during his time in office, where he was enjoyed an almost 85% to 90% popularity with the American people, versus the sort of condemnation that has been of a much more recent character um, and certainly developed um, in its attacks on Kissinger and uh, seeing him in particularly strong ways. I don't think uh, the, the framing of this as the sort of wise and visionary versus evil and uh, 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 reckless is a bit extreme. I don't come down, uh, I think, in either camp. I think I've tried to see Kissinger in all dimensions, um, and that I, but I have acted with a degree of understanding, if not approval, uh, of his uh, behavior in office. What were the sources for my book? Um, Kissinger wrote more than 4,000 pages of memoir. Um, there are enormous publications. There's, uh, Kissinger is also very documented. The papers about him uh, fill many, many shelves um, and many boxes in the archives. I used also the Nixon tapes, which became really almost completely available over the last few years. Um, they are uh, a very uh, time-consuming resource to use. You have to listen. They're not transcribed, and they take a lot of time. 
I also used something that uh, is different. It's the television news archive that's at Vanderbilt University, which records how Kissinger was seen by the American people during the years he was in office. Um, this archive goes back to 1968. So it captures Kissinger from his introduction to the American people through his, um, uh, through his departure uh, from office in 1977. Um, television news during that time was very trusted. It was a trusted news source. It was seen as the American newspaper. And even though there were attacks on its bias, it enjoyed a credibility and a, uh, uh, a standing with Americans that was quite impressive compared to today's more partisan media and the degree to which media is mistrusted. I begin each chapter of the book with a TV vignette that gives you some idea of Kissinger's increasing prominence and role during this time period. And I hope that that uh, captures it. I, I would have loved to provide links um, to the actual TV um, recordings for everyone. Unfortunately, the networks have put in all sorts of restrictions on the Vanderbilt on the use of the archive that prevents this from being that. I hope someday that'll be challenged by fair use doctrine and something else. But right now I was unable to, to link um, my uh, uh, directly to the uh, TV clips that I have. What's my central argument in the book? It's not where I started. I started very differently than I ended up. And I think that's uh, I'm glad that is the case because I, I think it's often the case that people write books based on their own views before they look at the evidence. Most previous studies, I think, focused on Kissinger's ideas, particularly his identification with realpolitik ideology of foreign policy, namely policies that enhanced America's political and military power and neglected values such as human rights and democratic reform. Kissinger always portrayed himself as something of an expert who stood above politics, offering his advice to politicians based on his expertise and knowledge of foreign policy. This is not an incorrect picture, but it's incomplete and at times misleading. I approach Kissinger as a political actor, as an advisor to presidents who understood the centrality of domestic politics and domestic partisan politics and foreign policy within the American system and who adjusted his perspectives, recommendations, and sometimes actions based on that. I uh, note a TV interview that I found in the uh, television archive where Kissinger did at the Republican convention in 1972, when CBS correspondent Dan Rather asked him if a political settlement in Vietnam would help the president's campaign. Kissinger responded that the president never talks to me about domestic politics. Well, I was struck by this because that same day I had listened to tapes that he had done in which they did talk about domestic politics. That was a big part of their thinking and, and the rest. I also stress in the book, and one of the other arguments is Kissinger's skillful manipulation of the media, becoming America's first celebrity diplomat, enhancing, which enhanced his personal power and prestige. Kissinger spent an enormous amount of time courting the media, both print and electronic, and the media responded particularly because Kissinger was part of an administration that was very hostile to the media. Remember Vice President Spiro Agnew's attack on the press of the media during it. Kissinger also personalized foreign policy, becoming a key figure in the relationship between America and its various allies and adversaries, even while often minimizing the role of individual leaders in foreign policy. And there's a wonderful story of him telling George H.W. Bush that interests, not personalities, are key to foreign policy, but him, of course, telling everyone else that his personality was central to American foreign policy. I, I quote a British foreign policy paper on this. They were quite aware of it. The tension between Kissinger's own recognition, I think, in the end of the limits of American power with his determination to exercise that power is central to understanding the significance of Kissinger for the history of American foreign policy. Now, I only have a few minutes left to make my 10 minutes, so let me summarize quickly. The book starts with a, a chapter that looks at Kissinger's life and career uh, before he becomes national security advisor for Nixon. He's brought in by Nixon in order to centralize foreign policy in the White House and to use that foreign policy for the political gain that it could obtain. Um, the first period of the Nixon presidency was one of failure, though, I argue, as they were not able to arrange a Vietnam settlement. Yet Kissinger became central, the Secretary of State and all but named during this time. Um, in the second half of the first Nixon presidency comes the triumphs, and I'm not particularly the triumph of the 1971 opening to China. And here I stress not the geopolitical significance of the opening to China as much as its domestic political influence. This was became something that Nixon saw as central to his reelection. 
the idea of opening up to China and, and the incredible response that received from the American people. China was hugely important and it became, I think it's one of the reasons for some of the mistakes they made, for example, in South Asia. China also afforded Nixon and Kissinger leverage with the Soviet Union and allowed them, I think, to pressure the Soviet Union and also to create a situation in which the Soviet Union did not cancel a summit meeting, even though Nixon had responded to the North Vietnamese offensive in April of 1972 with bombing of North Vietnam, Soviet Union still went ahead with the summit and the Seoul II agreement because the Soviet and Chinese rivalry was so central and Nixon and Kissinger's triangular diplomacy was very effective and played off that. The great power politics also helped bring about a settlement in Vietnam. It was a very flawed settlement, and I make that clear in the book. Um, Watergate changed things. Um, Kissinger became Secretary of State. I don't see this quite as Barrett sees it. I don't see this blackmail as much as Nixon holding on to his Secretary of State because of Kissinger's popularity and the hope that foreign policy would allow Nixon to survive the impeachment challenge that he faced. It didn't. Uh, but Kissinger also, I think, in the Nixon, in the second Nixon administration, has one of his most fundamental achievements, which is in Middle East diplomacy, where his ability to moderate settlements between Egypt and Syria and um, Israel is central and becomes a central legacy of his um, uh, a period as a foreign policy advisor. It is the reason he should have been given the Nobel Peace Prize, not the Vietnam Agreement. I then conclude with a look at Kissinger during the Ford years where Kissinger saw himself as in practice almost a partner of Gerald Ford. Unfortunately, he diminished Ford. And this is one reason why presidents subsequent to Gerald Ford never called him back in an official position because he was so dominating a figure. Uh, Ford did see some achievements, uh, Sinai II in the Vladivostok Agreement, but Ford also lost narrowly in 1976 with his inability to explain Kissinger's detente policy to a uh, national audience during the debate with Jimmy Carter. Kissinger had a long life after his time in office. I deal with that and some of the involvements he's had. He was an influential commentator and figure in the foreign policy establishment. I have a mixed verdict on Kissinger. He was an extraordinary figure, larger than life in both positive and negative ways. He provided foreign policy with an intelligent design that many Americans approved of. He enjoyed that approval, but he also made some uh, key mistakes, particularly in Chile. South Asia, Argentina, and others. Um, all of this, I think, adds up to the fact that Kissinger had a uh, very large significance in 20th century American history as a figure in American foreign policy, and that someone who could still be an issue in the political campaign of 2016 is well worth examining, looking at, and I think um, a figure of great significance. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Tom. Much appreciated. Uh, you gave us a pretty good, quick overview. Tell us, what was his greatest achievement in view of you, and what also was his greatest failure, and uh, where the controversy surrounding him is well justified? Okay. I, I think on achievements, I think it's a, a question, is something of a toss-up between the opening to China, which I still think is a very valid uh, issue in terms of how it's conducted, and the Middle East where Kissinger's approach and, and uh, um, essentially creating a situation in which there would no be, be no further uh, major wars between nation states in the Middle East was central. So I see those two as being quite, quite significant. As far as major failure, I would probably list Chile because I think that was a tremendous overreaction that damaged American uh, prestige in so many ways. It was an overreaction to the danger of a Marxist takeover of a Latin American state. It, did, it, it, it was based on a misreading of Chilean politics, a misunderstanding of the uh, various dynamics at work there. Uh, it wasn't completely paranoid in the, the fact that Salvador Allende did have ties to the Soviet Union and, China, and Cuba, but I think it was a tremendous overreaction and the involvement of the United States in the coup plotting of 1970 um, uh, is still one of the more regrettable um, aspects of American foreign policy. So what was Kissinger's role exactly in Chile? Did he uh, uh, plan the coup? Did he encourage the coup? Or what was his role? Well, I think you have to distinguish between two different situations. In 1970, he was involved in the uh, planning for the coup. This was largely, I, I make the case in the book that this is largely him uh, following Nixon's lead, making himself essential to Nixon on this, because Nixon really felt this very strongly that 
any communism in Latin America had, would have decisive uh, domestic political ramifications that could damage him for re-election in 1972. So Nixon was quite uh, determined to do something about Chile. And Kissinger played a role there in uh, overseeing the attempt uh, to keep Allende from assuming the presidency that ended up, um, I think, going very badly wrong and leading to the murder of General Schneider, for example. Um, um, now, in the case of um, the coup in 73, I think the American involvement there was much more limited. It, it did not, Kissinger uh, was not directly involved, I think, in the coup planning that actually took place in 73. Where I fault him there is the degree to which they welcomed the Pinochet regime so quickly and uh, began very quickly to excuse its human rights violations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we will talk some more about that uh, with the other presentations also regarding the questions from the audience. Let me ask you a final question before we move on. Uh, Kissinger had ambitions, political ambitions, after uh, the Ford administration, but was it really realistic for him to expect to be recalled as Secretary of State? As you know, that normally never happens. Once you've been Secretary of State, they sent you into retirement rather than call you back. So how realistic was that? Well, I don't think it was as unrealistic as it looks. I, I mean, among the Republican contenders in 1980, the only one who said he would not appoint Kissinger as Secretary of State was not Ronald Reagan, who most people assume. It was George H.W. Bush who resented uh, Kissinger for his how Kissinger had treated him in China. Um, and uh, in that sense, now when Reagan is elected, he does feel like there's too much baggage with Kissinger, particularly his right-wing uh, group, the Jesse Helms and the more right-wing extremists who distrusted Kissinger. But I don't think it was as unrealistic as it, as it seems. Kissinger enjoyed enormous uh, uh, political leverage within the Republican Party. He enjoyed a great deal of support. He was seen as a, a key figure. Reagan brought him in for advice on the Soviet Union, on Middle East issues, on China. So um, I don't think it was as unrealistic. Of course, um, as time went on um, in the Reagan years and Reagan reversed policy, Kissinger became a critic. Then he tried to attach himself to George H.W. Bush, but uh, Bush, Bush had a, a, a reservation about uh, Kissinger. And by the time uh, uh, Kissinger did court Dan Quayle, um, Bush's vice president, and had uh, had fate been somehow different and been treated treated Dan Quayle more kindly, perhaps he would have uh, ended up as Secretary of State. But he was he was actually angling. He thought he might get it in 1988 when Bush was elected. All right, but by the time uh, the, the George W. Bush administration came round, it was too late for him. It was too late by that point. Well, thank you very much indeed. That brings us to our second speaker, that is Professor Bernd Greiner. Bernd and I also go uh, back a little while. I think we met in Berlin some time ago. And Bernd Greiner joins us from Berlin today. Until very recently, Bernd was a professor at the University of Hamburg, where he directed the research program on the theory and history of violence at the Hamburg Institute of Social Research. Bernd is among Germany's most prolific and well-known political historians and political scientists. He has also just published a big book on Henry Kissinger, Guardian of the Empire, a, bi a biography. It uh, came out with Beck 2020. So far, the book uh, has only been published in German, but I hope it will soon be available in English too. Bernd has published many other books on American foreign relations, such as a book on 9-11, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and a book on the Vietnam War and on the United States and the Cold War and also a volume on the famous Morgenthau plan. Most of Burns' books, unfortunately, have been published in German, but his book War Without France, the United States in Vietnam, was also published in English by Yale University Press in 2008. It's a great pleasure to welcome Bernd Greiner to the Krasnow event series. Tonight, Bernd will enlighten us about Kissinger's policies in Latin America, but about also many other uh, countries and many other aspects of Kissinger's controversial politics. Bernd, over to you. Well, first of all, thank you, Klaus, for uh, inviting me to this distinguished uh, lecture series. And uh, also thank you to you, Ara, and to, uh, to you, Tom, for joining in this uh, debate. Uh, again, as in the case of Tom, I have about 10, to 12 minutes and uh, I will use this time to shed some light from my perspective on Henry Kissinger's um, 
policy in the, with regard to the third world. And I will use the third world perspective as a lens to debate some of his overarching ideas and concepts of foreign and security policy. And I will do so in an attempt to, um, to provoke a discussion. So some of the arguments, of course, uh, will sharpen some ideas which uh, I present in the book. We'll see what happens after that. Okay, it's broken down in about three parts, three to four minutes each. The first observation is that um, Kissinger's notion of third world conflicts, third world conflicts, not the third world as such, but third world conflicts, is centered on the issue of counterinsurgency. To put it more precisely, on a fairly, in my perspective, narrow concept of counterinsurgency by repressive means. Seen from this perspective, his thinking reflects less a tradition of political realism or realist philosophy, but rather a militarization of political thinking in the wake of the history of violence in the 20th century. Basically, what we can observe in his writings and in his political counsel is a sort of a circular reasoning. At the beginning, there's always drama. Whenever conflicts pop up, be it in Asia, in Latin America, or in the Near East, Kissinger tends to frame these as a deadly threat for the US and the Western way of life. There is always a Dunkirk moment or a Rhineland situation or a final showdown setting with a totalitarian enemy. In times of emergency, however, time is of the essence. And if time is of the essence, you cannot allow yourself the luxury of long drawn out modes of conflict resolution. What is in need are speedy, decisive moves, draining the resources of resistance and revolution. And in the end, there is no alternative to applications of force, lest you risk even more deadly crises to unfold. Which brings us back to the very beginning and closes the argument in full circle. As I said, it's always a sort of life and death struggle, no matter where and no matter why, the very survival of the free world is at stake, if you listen to him. Kissinger perceives the third world foremost, if not solely, through the lens of a religiously inflated understanding of world politics. Whenever and wherever the Soviet Union is not engaged, whenever and wherever there are no domestic left-wing groups or movements of non-alignment taking a third course between East and West, wherever all this is missing, he all but loses interest. That's why vast areas of Africa and Latin America are a black box for him for long periods of time. And to mention a point already made, it is hard to reconcile this style of thinking with a political theory in general and with the American school of political realism in particular. Kissinger, more often than not, does not argue like a nuanced analyst interested in the equilibrium of power, but rather, and this is a, a sharpened <clears throat> observation of mine, rather he sounds like a West Point mix of Edmund Burke, Oswald Spengler and Carl Schmitt, or sometimes even like an ideologue on the warpath. And this he does not do by accident. For him, this approach was a foolproof recipe for a fast track career in Cold War America. Second observation, Kissinger's notion, notion of third world conflicts punctuates the observation that aside from Cold War settings, he is deeply rooted in what I call a colonial 19th century style of thinking. He cherishes all the fallacies 
of a white man's burden perception of the world. On the one hand are the movers, ready to move. And on the other hand are pawns, ready to be moved and to endure. More often than not, he couldn't care less about the situation on the ground, about economic or social conflicts, about the roots of political protests, or about the dynamics of nationalism. Just think of his notorious remark towards Latin America, nothing of importance ever comes from the South. Or think of his comment on Allende's election in Chile, just because a Marxist was elected by popular vote does not mean that we have to accept it. In other words, the third world for him, mainly and foremost, is a testing ground for power and credibility, a resource to be exploited for America's national interest, and not a resource to be fostered for the international common good. Now, this flawed perspective explains serious deficiencies in his political counsel. In the case of Vietnam, he counseled a fourth-rate country must have a breaking point. In other words, go in and bomb the hell out of them. In the case of Angola, he counseled who controls the capital controls the country. In other words, mobilize shock troops of mercenaries and let them do the job. All of these ill-advised suggestions were built on a misguided idea that the US, by all limits of its power, is still in the driver's seat, able to manipulate foreign actors at will, and capable of containing other people's desires. Third and final observation, Kissinger's notion of third world conflicts punctuates the observation that his thinking is firmly rooted in a politics of fear. The quintessential case in point, of course, is Vietnam. Like Nixon, he was convinced that the US could have withdrawn in 1968, before he came into office. And like Nixon, he made a strong case that withdrawal was not an option at this very juncture. Why? because before withdrawing from Vietnam, the world had to be convinced that the US military is and remains invincible and that the US can muster the political will to use this power anytime. In other words, Vietnam will fail in the end, but its failure must be attributed to the ineptitude of its rulers and not to the US. Therefore, he made a strong case for extensive bombing campaigns, for shows of force, including madman performances. And this exactly is part of his lifelong obsession. Power rests in the fear of others. Diplomacy is the art of coercion and credibility rests on military resolve. For Kissinger, if I read it correctly, Diplomacy is not the art of balancing out diverging interests. It's the art of enforcing your own interest, be it in Vietnam or any other part of the world. Any other part of the world is in this case to be taken literally. Whenever there was the slightest occasion, he counseled a policy of coercion, vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon, North Korea, Cuba, Cambodia, and so on and so forth. Again, we witness a set of ideas rooted in imperial politics of the past and utterly useless for the challenges of his own time, not to mention the challenges of the 21st century. All in all, and based on his third world policy, I think we can make the case that Kissinger was a one dimensional thinker and a captive of narrow concepts of international politics. The point is not that he was a brainchild of the Cold War. The point is rather that he never even tried to break loose from these confines. He did not make the attempt, even though in his own time, a wide array of different approaches was debated. And even though prominent contemporaries 
did their best to put these alternatives on the agenda. He certainly was aware of the limits of American power, but he wanted to revoke these limits and he wanted to tackle the decline of American power with recipes of the past. Therefore, he has a penchant for America first, for a preponderance of American power, for the military as the bedrock of this power, and for military answers to political challenges. And we should never forget whom he made pay for this policy. We should never forget that hundreds of thousands gave their lives for Kissinger's way of ordering the world in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, East Timor, and Chile, and Argentina. And we should never forget that Kissinger did and does not show any sense of compassion, any sense of remorse for the victims of these bloodbaths. Instead, he ridicules, ridicules his critics as impeded nuns and priests, fit for religious services, but not for the arena of international politics. This outrageous record cannot and should not be downplayed. And in the final analysis, it is another way of saying Kissinger did provide an everlasting disservice to the Western cause. Provided we define this cause as respect for life and the pursuit of liberty and happiness. Making life cheap, Kissinger invited the adversaries of freedom and democracy to point their fingers at the very notion of freedom and democracy. Hopefully this was within the time limit. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. This was most interesting and illuminating. Mm -hmm. I take it you're not a big fan of Henry Kissinger's. Did I uh, interpret that correctly? Uh, well, it's not a matter of being a fan or a card-carrying member of a fan club. <laughs> no, no. no. no it, um, no, but let, let me ask you first, on, how, actually, how important was Kissinger? Because in the last resort, it was of American foreign policy is presidential foreign policy. The Secretary of State or the National Security uh, Advisor has a subordinate role. And while, as we uh, heard from Tom, while Kissinger's role definitely increased with the unfolding of the Watergate crisis and Kissinger became more important, but that really was a few years into the administration. So was Chile, was opening to China, was detente with the Soviet Union, was Vietnam above all, was that really Kissinger's policies or were these Nixon's policies? Well, in my book, I try to argue, um, picking up on a German proverb about Koch and Kellner, about cook and server, that actually Nixon was the mastermind behind this policy. Of course, Kissinger bought into many of these um, ideas of these basic principles launched by Nixon, but this does not mean that he was the mover. Uh, Tom, at the very beginning, mentioned uh, the tapes as a resource, an important resource for historical analysis. And uh, if you listen to these tapes, and if you read some of the transcribed records of the tapes, uh, you will, uh, yeah, it's not hard to find out who made the major moves, who set the tone, and who followed up. And uh, I think that uh, um, Kissinger's self-styled importance uh, does not uh, properly uh, cover the record. Mm -hmm. I think many people would agree with you that uh, America's Vietnam policy, the policy uh, towards Chile, were very problematic, to put it mildly. Uh, uh, but what about the opening to China? What about detente with the Soviet Union? W would you see them in the same critical light or are these more positive aspects of Kissinger's and Nixon's policy? Definitely they are more positive. In the first place, <laughs> there was no war involved. Um, no, no, uh, joking aside, uh, definitely more positive. I take issue only with one um, remark or one, one, one framing of this policy, the opening to China. It sounds as if he or Nixon or the two of them opened a locked door. I think this doesn't quite cover the historical evidence 
-hmm. Had it not been for Mao and Chu and Lai on the other side, who opened the door and invited the Americans to walk in, nothing would have happened. Of course, it is an historic achievement to realize an opportunity and to make good of it. And this has to be uh, told in their credit that they didn't miss this opportunity. And uh, the second qualification in terms of China policy from my side would be to say that it's not, that it's not only a US Chinese relations, it's a triangular policy. You always have to take uh, the Soviet Union into the equation, respectively the way Kissinger and Nixon tried to counterbalance the Soviets with the Chinese and the Chinese with the Soviets. So it's a, it's a very complicated uh, um, structure and policy, which in the very end, I think did not pay off uh, the way it had been expected to because both sides, Beijing and Moscow came to distrust them for this very notion of playing the Russian card or the Chinese card. They felt kind of pressured and used and this made them very, very reserved and anxious and distrustful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you look briefly at Kissinger's role in the Nixon administration and then in the Ford administration, though we again heard from uh, uh, Tom quite correctly that Kissinger kind of dominated Gerald Ford, who was kind of innocent in foreign relations, but still the Ford foreign policy has a much more positive reputation also with hindsight and at the time than the Nixon uh, foreign policy. How do you explain that? Because it was the same Kissinger or did he have a sudden change of mind and became more constructive in your view? No, it, it, I think it has a lot to do that uh, Richard Nixon was Mr. Ugly uh, for, for a vast majority of, uh, of, of, of the liberal American constituency. I mean, going back to the ultra his case and to McCarthy in the late, in the early fifties, Nixon was presented and styled as the dark side of American political tradition, uh, which did not apply to Gerald Ford. So uh, you, you had a different perspective on the person in power, on the person in the White House. Uh, and Kissinger drew much of his reputation from this misreputation, which Nixon had. So he, was, he you had the guy with the white head and the guy with the black head. Uh, this role model was fairly fixed and Kissinger played it up, made the most of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm sure we will take it further in a little while, but first we come to our third speaker and that is Professor Barbara Keyes. Barbara and I met a few years ago in Melbourne in Australia, but she now joins us from the UK. Barbara Keyes is a professor of US and international history at the University of Durham in the north of England. She got her PhD from Harvard and taught in both the United States and Australia before she moved to the UK. In 2019, Barbara served as the president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. Barbara has had many prestigious fellowships and received multiple grants and awards for her work. Among her many research interests are Henry Kissinger's role in US foreign relations and also Chinese American relations since the 1970s. Barbara has also published a lot like our two other speakers, such as Reclaiming American Virtue, the human rights revolution of the 1970s, which came out with Harvard in uh, 2014 and globalizing sport, national rivalry and international community in the 1930s, which won the Woodward Medal in Humanities. And more recently, the ideals of global sport from peace to human rights in 2019. And of course, that fits in well with Henry Kissinger, our topic today, because Kissinger is a keen soccer fan. For our topic today, perhaps, Barbara's article in Diplomatic History in 2011 is most interesting. It is entitled Henry Kissinger, the Emotional Statesman. And I think we would like to know more about that. It is wonderful that Barbara can uh, join us today. And tonight she will comment on Tom's and Burns' uh, recent Kissinger biographies and tell us about Kissinger and US-Chinese relations from the 1970s to the very present. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you so much for having me, Klaus. Um, it's really an honor to be here with 
these two very distinguished biographers. And as Klaus said, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about both of the books and then talk about Kissinger and China. So these are both absolutely terrific books. Um, they both share several characteristics, uh, namely that they're relatively brief. They're based on serious and extensive research, including um, in the Nixon tapes, the White House tapes, and they're both genuinely entertaining. And of course, Kissinger is a very entertaining figure. There's great material to use, but both of these books use the material, the anecdotes, the humorous, uh, sometimes horrifying quite quotations um, in, in a really deft way. And they're both very enjoyable reads. They're both very attuned to the way that Kissinger used the media. And as Tom has indicated, his book is by far the best account of the way that Kissinger dominated television news. Another common characteristic is, they, is that they both have really terrific chapters on Kissinger in the last 40 years, which is a fairly neglected topic. It continues to surprise me that no one has written a book on, uh, an entire book on Kissinger's last uh, 45 years. So the contributions that the two books make, I would say, are as follows. That Tom's book is an absolutely fantastic resource for those of us teaching um, at the undergraduate level in particular. My undergraduates really enjoyed his book last term. And as, as Tom has also indicated, his book makes an important contribution to seeing Kissinger as a domestic politics tactician um, and also in the way he uses uh, the media. Barron's book, I think, is the first critical book about Kissinger in German, correct me if I'm wrong, but the landscape around Kissinger's rep reputation is different in Germany than it is in the US. And Barron's book is immensely colorful. It does use the White House tapes extensively. I found it at times laugh out loud funny. It is more of a character study. Um, and I think Barron emphasizes Kissinger's power seeking. And if I had to encapsulate the differences between the two books in a single sentence, I would say, you know, please correct me if, if I'm wrong, uh, but I would say that Tom emphasizes Kissinger's pursuit of the national interest, sometimes deflected by ego and ambition, whereas Barron tends to see more pursuit of self-interest. I'll leave it at that. And in order to ensure that I am very concise, I am actually going to play a recording of my comments about Kissinger and China. Both of these books cover Kissinger's capacity to seduce and to manipulate the media. And arguably this gave Americans a distorted picture of Kissinger during the time he was in office. And I wanna make the point that this continued. Kissinger continued to use and manipulate the media after leaving office. And that as a result, the American public has continued to have a deeply misguided view of who Kissinger is and what he does. Let me illustrate this point by showing you a couple of introductions to interviews with Kissinger done by the media in the last 10 years. They represent an incredibly common phenomenon of identifying Kissinger, explaining who he is to the American public only by saying that he is a former Secretary of State. Few people know as much about foreign policy, especially as it pertains to Russia, as former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. We sat down with him at his office in New York. Well, here in New York, I earlier was talking with Henry Kissinger, the U.S. Secretary of State under Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, He's remained an influential, if sometimes controversial, voice of U.S. diplomacy over the intervening decades. With me here in Washington tonight is Henry Kissinger. He has a lifetime of experiences with China. He led President Nixon's opening to China and has been there more than 80 times. So to the extent that Kissinger is something other than a former diplomat, he's portrayed as an intellectual. I mean, he has this New York office in which presumably he just sits around writing books and dispensing wisdom. But as the China expert Elizabeth Economy aptly noted, Kissinger has spent more time negotiating business than negotiating policy. But we know far too little about Kissinger's business dealings in the last four decades. And while there continues to be important work being done on Kissinger in office, as these books demonstrate, and they do, of course, also have those excellent chapters on Kissinger out of office, but there's a massive gaping hole in our understanding of the full scope of what Kissinger has been doing 
for the last 45 years. And so what I'm gonna do now is just very, very briefly point to a couple of themes that I'm exploring in this project that I'm working on, on Kissinger's relationship with China over the last 45 years. And many of you will remember the recent controversy in December of last year, when the vice dean at the School of International Relations at Renmin University said that China and the US had been able to settle disagreements before, before Trump, uh, because we have our old friends who are at the top of America's core inner circle of power and influence. And Kissinger, of course, has long been one of these old friends. When Kissinger visits China, he gets publicity in China. As in this example of a visit not many months after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, the coverage of Kissinger in the People's Daily is regular and it is effusive. So Kissinger's approval and praise of Chinese leaders is used to bolster their legitimacy at home. And in fact, in 2004, political scientist Peter Hayes Brees called the Chinese craving for American praise a Kissinger complex, referring to the fact that Chinese nationalists used to enjoy it when famous Americans lauded China. What my new project focuses on is Kissinger's role in the US as a pro-China lobbyist in a variety of guises. He often appears in the media to defend China, and he works in a variety of other ways, including, as we know, informal and informal US government advisory roles. The document that I'm showing here is a fax that Kissinger sent after that 1989 visit to China when he met with Deng Xiaoping and other leaders. It's 26 pages long, and it makes a detailed case on the basis of what he claims is an intimate knowledge of the power dynamics within the Chinese leadership not to pursue sanctions. This fax was sent to a variety of influential people, and it's an example of how Kissinger tried to influence opinion among the foreign policy elite, which would then influence policy. More noteworthy, but much harder to research, is the business element. Remember Elizabeth Economy's reminder that Kissinger has long been a businessman. During those meetings with Deng, he was also serving US corporate interests. At all of those meetings and dinners, in that 1989 visit, Kissinger was accompanied by Judith Hope, a member of the Union Pacific Corp Board, and Hank Greenberg, chairman of AIG, an insurance corporation with business interests in China. And Hank Greenberg and Kissinger and China have a very long, tight relationship. But it was not just that Kissinger had consulting interests at stake here. He himself had a lot of money at stake in 1989 because he had just launched an investment firm which has been written about a bit before, it got a tiny bit of publicity at the time, uh, but is an example of the kind of thing that we generally know too little about when we think about Kissinger since 1976. But historians, of course, are naturally drawn to documents and we have huge documentation on Kissinger in office. It's much harder to study Kissinger Associates, this consulting firm that Kissinger set up in 1982. Journalists have no excuse for their neglect of the topic and I, have no explanation for why they've neglected it. But Kissinger, working through Kissinger Associates, aided by easy access to the media, think tanks, government, and as a corporate board member and advisor, Kissinger has been a very powerful lobbyist for the PRC. He and Kissinger Associates have worked to normalize the PRC as a market-based country that plays a constructive role in international relations, and that is a safe place for Western corporations and should be given liberal trading status. The picture behind me is from the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games and shows how all of these strands at certain times and places came together. Various strands in this case are Kissinger's connections to the International Olympic Committee, his extraordinary status in China, his friendliness with world leaders and American presidents and the business element. So let me just end by saying that Kissinger is in business. He's been in business for over 40 years. And the media has by and large given him a free pass to pursue his business interests by pretending that Kissinger is merely a foreign policy intellectual. I would argue that for historians of the future, this failure of journalism is going to be one of the major stories they tell about Henry Kissinger. Thank you very much indeed. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. That was the most interesting. So 
are you saying when Xi Jinping comes to Washington, uh, and I'm sure he will be invited again sometime in the future, if not right now, um, then he usually goes to New York to see Kissinger. Does that mean that Kissinger really works on behalf of China to sell Chinese interests to the Western world, or is that not correct? Well, Kissinger has been pro-China since his visit in 1971. So I think he has a personal interest in seeing that the relationship that he began to build in 1971 continues. That's quite apart from any financial interest that he has at stake. But he's also become, um, I think, as Tom said, uh, or, or was it you, Klaus, a, a rich man um, by uh, becoming a consultant, which is largely, a, it's a global uh, business and certainly he, he facilitates um, business around the world, but he has built a reputation as a China expert in particular. And so um, he has a, a, an interest, uh, many different facets of interest really in um, having the US have a good relationship with China and having liberal uh, trading uh, relationship. Yeah, I seem to recall that George W. Bush offered him a position as the chairman of a commission and he had uh, to reveal his business interests and in the end he turned down the job because he didn't want to reveal these interests that would fit in with what you just said. So what do we know about Kissinger Associates, his consultancy? Well, it's highly secretive. So when Walter Isaacson published his biography of Kissinger in 1992, he had ferreted out quite a bit of information about Kissinger Associates. And I think Kissinger clamped down after that book came out and made it harder for us to find out information about what Kissinger Associates is up to. Um, as you noted, he was appointed to head the 9-11 Commission, but then stepped down um, over the perception that there might be conflicts of interest that he wasn't going to reveal because he wasn't going to make his client list public. Uh, so it is actually quite difficult to find out information about exactly what Kissinger Associates does, who its clients are. Um, Kissinger apparently gives his advice only by telephone, so there, there isn't the possibility that uh, the, the advice could be uh, leaked in the form of documents. Um, and that's one of the challenges of, of, of writing about, about this topic. Mm -hmm. But what is the difference to other former politicians who have a consultancy. Maudlin Al Albright comes to mind, the former Secretary of State. Uh, uh, Henry Paulson, the former uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and many others come to mind. Even the current Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, he was involved in a consultancy until he uh, accepted the offer to become Secretary of State. So maybe one could say perhaps Kissinger has been more successful with his consultancy. It made him richer than maybe other former politicians. But is there that much of a basic difference in Kissinger's approach and the approach of other former politicians? So you're absolutely right that former politicians do go into business for themselves. But I think the difference with Kissinger is, first of all, his stature. Whatever he says is picked up in the newspapers in a way that you know uh, many other politicians or former diplomats, they simply don't have that um, opening to the media. So part of it is simply about the extent to which Kissinger's opinions matter and get publicity. And that has to do in part with this image that we have of him, that he is just this sort of intellectual. He's the foreign pol policy guru. And he will tell us you know, clear headedly and impartially what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, but uh, uh, maybe my final question, how has he managed to maintain that kind of uh, being in the middle of everything? Uh, you said he caught a journalist, but uh, somehow he must have been, uh, have a particular knack of doing that because I'm sure other former politicians also tried to do that, but less successfully. So how, he, how does he manage, any idea? Maybe we can all learn from that. <laughs> I have so it's a great question because, of course, when he's in office, he has insider information galore and, and he can parlay that information into, um, you know, connections and access. But what does he do when he's out of office? I think part of it has to do with his extraordinary networking capabilities. And, and Neil Ferguson is, is very much aware of this. He has said that volume two of his biography of Kissinger might be subtitled The Networker. Uh, so I think his his um, his work ethic and, and and particularly his 
his ethic around just socializing. I mean, the man goes to so many dinners and parties um, and keeps up these social connections and really has done since he had that seminar at Harvard. Um, I think that more than anything is the key to his continued success. Thank you. I wonder if he has been quarantining right now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara. That was most uh, instructive. And I would again like to uh, have a little bit of a commercial break by showing you briefly the slides of the books of our speakers here. And if uh, Anna would show the first slide, then I will mention that. Uh, you'll have to enable screen sharing for me. I don't, uh, you can't do that right now? It says that it's disabled currently. Can you do it, Peter? Pete? Hold on. Well, then we need to show the slides at the end and go on. Let me uh, just mention Thomas Schwartz's book, Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political biography, which came out with Hill and Wang 2020. And Tom has also written that very good book, Lyndon Johnson and Europe, um, The Shadow of Vietnam, which came out in 2003. And then we have Bernd Greiner's recent biography of Henry Kissinger, um, Guardian of the Empire, so far only in German. But the book which is available by Bernd in English is War Without France, the United States in Vietnam, Yale University Press in 2010. And then Reclaiming American Virtue came out uh, uh, written by Barbara Keys in uh, uh, Harvard University Press 2014. And then I would like to recommend Barbara's interesting, most interesting article in Diplomatic History 2011, Henry Kissinger, the Emotional Statesman. And then I would also like to refer to my forthcoming book on uncertain allies, Nixon, Kissinger, and the threat of United Europe that will, that will only be out in November of this year, also with Yale University Press. And of course, uh, this book is a great read, and the other books I've just mentioned are all great uh, uh, reads and available via Amazon.com and, of course, via your local bookstore. Don't forget, place your local bookstore. Go out and buy one or two of the books just mentioned. That would be great. Thank you very much. And we turn to uh, our audience questions. I can see there have been plenty already, and Pete will ask the first question. Yes, uh, our first question is from Martha Lee Keleff, and we'll offer this question to Tom. Is it possible that Kissinger's support of the domino theory in Vietnam was based on his observations of Nazi Germany's behavior uh, during the Second World War? Um, yes, although I would qualify it because Kissinger was not, uh, Kissinger uh, certainly uh, had expressed early on uh, a view in support of the domino theory, but uh, by the time of 1968, he is much more skeptical about that. And uh, th th that's not, I think, what drives him. Um, I, I think this is actually something that uh, I just want to comment on that I think uh, does play a role in Kissinger's intellectual biography as Barrett was talking about it, that uh, this is someone who, uh, let's, let's face it, the, you know, his early experiences were being expelled from Germany in 1938, um, his family losing a great deal, um, losing 17 relatives in the Holocaust at least, and then coming back as a man in the American army and liberating a concentration camp um, and seeing the devastation that war had brought. And I think these formative experiences, I make the point in the uh, book that uh, Kissinger came to see international diplomacy as a life and death stakes game um, for very good reasons, because it was for him and it was for his family and it, it did play a role. So I do think, I do think one has to recognize this and that I do think um, as, as uh, 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 Barrett's critique is, I think, uh, accurate on many issues, but it's incomplete because it completely ignores, you might say, the great powers issue and the nuclear war issue, which was much a very, very important part of Kissinger's goal was to prevent war uh, from breaking out in between the major powers that would be very destructive, um, as well as preventing totalitarianism of the sort that he had seen firsthand 
and that it affected his family and life. So um, I think the domino theory was part of that, the, the sense of what Nazi aggression meant and the need to resist aggressive powers like the Soviet Union um, was very important. And I think that played a role in Kissinger's thinking. And I think Barbara did get quite accurately since I, I do think Kissinger was self-serving, but I do think he had a sense of what the national interest of the United States was. And I think he pursued it. And for the most part, I think uh, successfully. So it was not just the interest of Harry, Henry Kissinger he was concerned about. Tom. No, you're muted. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, I, I, I think, uh, I think certainly, uh, it's characteristic of most advisors and politicians that they sometimes mix their personal interest in with the national interest, and that certainly is the case. And Ara's um, discussion of Kissinger's business interest certainly raises that in terms of how Kissinger behaved toward China. But I do think there was also a national interest question there about behavior toward China about uh, integrating China into the world economy that also has to be taken into consideration. And um, it is one of the complexities of interpreting the actions and behavior of, of, of uh, diplomats and policy advisors and politicians. Okay. Um, and I, I do think in Kissinger's case, uh, it is a complex question. Thank you very much. Can I ask Anna to ask the next question? And also, can I encourage our speakers not to mute themselves and we can be more spontaneous, yeah? <laughs> okay. Anna, please. Mm. Um, our next question is from someone whose screen name is Roan at Home, uh, who asks, how do you think Kissinger's view of the relationships between the United States, China, and Russia in the 70s would differ from our current situation? Bernd, do you want to try that? Oops, different from the current situation, of course. Um, what comes to mind at the very beginning is uh, a similarity. Um, in the late 60s, we had a war in Vietnam. Now we have a war in Syria. And Washington and Moscow both charge the other side of fostering, fueling this conflict. And both charge the other side of not doing enough to defuse and to uh, kind of confine the conflict. But apart from this obvious um, parallel, there are, of course, major differences. In the late 1960s, we had a more or less bipolar world. Of course, if you take China as part of the socialist camp and the US as leader of the Western world, it was bipolar. Of course, it was more nuanced, but I think it's fair enough to, 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 to claim the bipolarity. As of today, we have a completely different world. It's no longer bipolar by any means. It's going in different directions. And uh, if there's any common denominator, you might call it on its way to multipolarity, whatever that means, or alliances of the willing, which was not on the agenda in the late 60s where the alliances were clearly cut. So um, I find it hard to, um, to make pinpoint judgments uh, on, and, and fine tune uh, similarities or differences aside from these general observations. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara, do you want to come in on that? <laughs> I think I'm gonna pass, it's such a complicated question and has, um, you know, because the situations are different between today and the 70s. I'd just like to make a quick comment that um, one of the things that came out during the Trump administration, there was a brief article that appeared that suggested that Trump's flirtation with Putin was part of trying to play a type of game of triangular diplomacy, and some actually attributed it to Kissinger. Of course, that wasn't. I mean, in the end, we alienated both, or both are alienated from the United States, and there is not uh, sort of this notion of triangular diplomacy. If anything, uh, the United States uh, probably assumes that China and Russia are going to uh, unite, uh, for the most part, in the United Nations and in other ways on issues like Syria against American interests. So there is um, now there is this sort of discussion of trying to reactivate an alliance of democracies to oppose China and Russia. But I, I, I'm skeptical 
Can I ask our uh, Pete or Anna to try to draw up these uh, slides after all? I think it should work now. And let me in the meantime ask you a question uh, which was submitted to uh, Tom by Steve Brady. He said, you talk about domestic politics, but didn't Kissinger and Nixon fail to create a domestic audience uh, in support of detente? And that really ruined the detente policy in the end. Uh, yes, um, ultimately, uh, because just because domestic politics is important doesn't mean you can you you can't fail at it. I actually think that Nixon and Kissinger um, there, that there was greater support for detente or stability in relationship with the Soviet Union than many people feel. I do think a lot of the attention, for example, in the 1976 campaign when Gerald Ford got rid of the word detente had to do with more the base of the Republican Party than it did with actual dissatisfaction with detente. And if you look at Jimmy Carter, he basically continues a type of detente policy. He doesn't throw it out. In fact, he tries to extend it in some directions um, and, and failed on that with some of his negotiations. So I don't think, I, I think the, the problem with detente is that it did rest on this notion that there was a certain stability and it provided, it, it, it uh, it was not conditioned in a sense to, uh, uh, to deal with what was some of the Soviet moves in the third world that could be characterized and certainly were by political opponents in the United States as gains for the Soviet Union and weakness for the United States. And that did erode the support for detente. I think it was greater than people recognized the support for a stable policy with the Soviet Union, but I do think it, it, it succumbed to uh, some of the political pressures of the American uh, uh, political system. Thanks very much. Does... Ah, there we are. That is uh, the books I wanted to advertise, which I think uh, they are well worth looking at and purchasing. Uh, Thomas Rhodes's new book, Henry Kissinger and American Power, and of course his older book on Lyndon Johnson and Europe. The new one came out with uh, uh, Wang and Hill and Wang, I think, 2020. Uh, and please, can we go to the next slide? That is Bernd Greiner's recent biography, Henry Kissinger, Wächter des Imperiums, Guardian of Empire, and his book in English, uh, War Without France, the United States in Vietnam. And then we come to Barbara Keith, and here is her book, Reclaiming American Virtue, the Human Rights Revolution of the 1970s, and that uh, uh, interesting article about Henry Kissinger, the emotional statesman. And then briefly, um, yes, that is uh, my book, which will be forthcoming in November, and a recent book on understanding global politics. And as I said before, these are all great reads. Thank you very much indeed. And we come to the next question. Pete, can you ask the next question? Yeah, we'll offer this question to Barbara. Uh, Alison Holbrooks from Chapel Hill ask, do you believe that the anti-Semitism and violence that Kissinger experienced throughout his youth impacted his later interactions with the world and eventually created the politician he became? Uh, can I let uh, one of the two biographers answer that question? Okay, who would like to dare? <laughs> Well, I've already had my say, so perhaps Baron should take it. It's, it's a very, very tricky question because Kissinger kind of bends over backwards to claim that his experiences as a young man or as a child in Germany, he left Germany in 38, when he did that leave, he was forced out, um, that his life this 15 year time span in Germany doesn't account for anything. That's his take. And he's very reserved in commenting, to put it mildly, very reserved in making any sort of relations between his former life in Germany and his life in the US. The only, the only written piece I can think of is a piece in the Wall Street Journal only last year on COVID-19, where he made the case of uh, saying, well, this reminds me of my uh, career in the American army uh, when we were battling the, 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 the German Wehrmacht, uh, uh, this, this sort of emergency. But that was a very, very, very rare occasion. 
Um, so, I mean, he had a hard time facing up to Nixon's, um, yeah, let's call it the way it was, Nixon's anti-Semitism. I mean, he, he was playing on it willfully, Nixon did. Uh, uh, he, he, was, he was, you know, with all these anti-Semitic jokes saying, well, Henry, don't you agree? And all that kind of obnoxious uh, uh, way of, of, of talk and interaction. Uh, he never, Kissinger never in a way responded which um, uh, gave you a clue uh, of what he was thinking. Of course, it must have been insult. I mean, give me a break, what else? Uh, but he never made, made any, any, any issue of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I quite agree with that. I once heard him talking about his grandmother, but I think that was a unique experience. He very seldom did that. And whenever I uh, talked to him, he never talked in German to me. It was always English. And that, you know, he could easily have done that in German, but that came, didn't even come into his mind. Tom, sorry. Well, but he, um, you know, the, what we do have, uh, we have these documents from his letters and that from the war period. And, we know that this had an experience, had an effect on him. I mean, he was, he's liberating a concentration camp and dealing with people who are dying in front of him. And he records this and it was a part of his thinking. And I think it did have a certain hardening effect in terms of how he looked at international politics and how he looked at um, issues related to foreign policy and, and the rest. So I, uh, he doesn't talk about them. And of course, the other thing to remember is that American uh, attitudes toward talking about your ethnic background really were not the same in the 1960s and 70s. Kissinger had a, a great deal of fear about talking about being Jewish. There's a, a thing in the Halderman Diaries where he uh, is, is afraid that he's going to have to resign after a, a piece in Newsweek identifies him as Jewish um, because that will have an effect. And Nixon, of course, kept him out of Middle East policy early on because he was Jewish. So this, I think this was something he's very conscious of, but you're right. Uh, Brandt's absolutely right that he tried to dismiss it and say it didn't have any effect. But I think um, this is something as a historian, we can deal, I think, with some of the uh, factors that were influencing him in the background. And I, I do think anti-Semitism in the sense of, of, of what had happened in Europe in the 1930s did have a considerable impact on him. Thank you very much. Anna, do you want to ask the next question? <laughs> Yes, Steve Brady from Washington, D.C. asks a question uh, he says is primarily for Professor Schwartz. Uh, in your book, you highlight Kissinger's ability to- We already asked that question. I, I, I asked question about the domestic politics. It was, I'm sorry about yeah. that. Um, <laughs> our next question is from uh, Fabian Hilfrich, who asks, how damaging was, the Kiss was Kissinger and Nixon's claim that the Paris Peace Accords were a great success? Um, he says, arguably, they sowed the seeds for the Vietnam War uh, and revisionism. Who is that directed to? I think it's broadly to- I was waiting for some volunteers. Okay. <laughs> um, Barrett, do you want to take it? Or I'd, I'd be glad to give my view, but I- yeah. you know. Framing framing the, the Paris Peace Accord, uh, probably the, the, the armistice of January 73. That's what, that's uh, an issue, right? Okay. Um, framing, Framing this agreement um, has been highly controversial from the uh, from the first day on, and uh, of course, I mean, put yourself in the in the shoes of Kissinger and Nixon. Of course, uh, the only chance they had was to sell it as a success. I mean, what else should they have done? Uh, which is true for the for the opposite opposite side also. But I think the core of this agreement is that uh, basically. It tells you a story that you can't revise or that you can't regain by political means what you lost on the battlefield. So this peace accord more or less circumscri uh, circumscribed uh, the military footprint on the ground. There were about 100,000, 120, 140,000 North Vietnamese soldiers in South Vietnam in January 73. So there was no way of speculating that they would you know, uh, sit aside and, 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 and let have uh, political developments go their own way, uh, detrimental to Hanoi's interest. Uh, 
And of course, Washington knew this. They wanted to have some sort of decent interval um, in between the final withdrawal of American troops and the inevitable uh, triumph uh, of uh, Hanoi over Saigon. Hmm. Tom, did you I would just I would just add that I think um, uh, they 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 did were looking for an interval. They just didn't expect because Nixon thought he'd be in office till seventy six. He didn't think they would it would happen while he was in charge. Um, when I think Nixon's Nixon's fall accelerated the the. Uh, uh, what Barrett called the inevitable, because I think Nixon did terrify the North Vietnamese, and they did not rec- they, they did recognize that he was capable of extraordinary violence in pursuit of, of uh, maintaining the South Vietnamese regime. So I think his departure um, uh, 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 accelerated the end of the of Vietnam War. But didn't Kissinger tell Haldeman that he thought the uh, South uh, Vietnamese would fall within 12 to 18 months? 18 months, yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. And I think that Kissinger was far more pessimistic. I just think that Nixon, and I, I make this point in the books, I think Nixon felt that maintaining South Vietnam was critical to his political uh, credibility in the United States. And I think he would have tried to maintain it had uh, uh, he been in power. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what do you make of that notion of American credibility? Was that one of the weak spots of the Nixon administration, that belief that American credibility was actually weaker than it really was? Well, credibility is, credibility is important in foreign policy. Um, I think it, it, we overemphasized it in Vietnam, but I think it is an important aspect of foreign policy. And um, this was something this was something that was seen as central to uh, commitments around the world. I think, as I say, I think it was exaggerated and, and overemphasized in, in Vietnam, but I don't think the idea that credibility has no uh, value, I think, is wrong. I think it, it states uh, states do judge um, other states by the value of their promises or the, the degree to which they believe they will actually behave in certain ways. Mm-hmm. I think and I agree, but at, let me add one point to this issue of credibility. Um, I agree with what uh, Tom just said, uh, and I would add one more nuance to this. It depends on how you define and how you perceive credibility. You could make the case that the U.S. would have enhanced its credibility if they had called this, if it, they had called it a day in '68, saying, "Okay, we did our best." or declare victory and walk out uh, if they had stopped the war at this very moment and not spent additional 25,000 American lives and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese lives for this futile effort uh, to gain what could not be gained. Mm-hmm. That's actually possibly, what, possibly, but you can't run counterfactuals. Right, and no morning, morning quarterbacking. <laughs> well, yes, and, and politically in 1969, the American people uh, would have rejected a, a, a withdrawal. It would have had. It would have required Nixon to really um, take a stance that would have been very different from his past stances. I, I I do think it would have been very difficult to make that case in 1969. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Barbara? Was it worth spending 25,000 of American lives and 100,000 of other lives on uh, staying in for the sake of credibility? I'll be very concise. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a that's that's putting it in terms of, all, of what we know now. It's not putting it in terms of what someone would have judged it in January of 1969. So. Right. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Tom. Wouldn't you agree that a fair amount, a fair amount, if not the majority, of political advisors and political elites, including military elites, in 68 and 69, made a case of call it a day go out. And uh, Nixon would not have risked uh, or would not have taken any major political risk in making this decision. Oh, I think that's wrong. That's completely wrong. It would have been a very big risk. Um, There were elites saying that, but I think any fair judgment of what American opinion looked like in the broad strata of the United States, not just the New York Times on this one, but Nixon's silent majority, which was a substantial number of Americans. Now, I, this is not a defense of that. It's simply saying that I think Nixon did make a political calculus about what the American people wanted or didn't want. And that, I think, in 1969 meant that they wanted something. They wanted the war to end. They didn't want it to end in defeat. 
defeat was still something that I think would have been a hard sell. But did, and that would have been the case. That would have been a defeat if the United States had withdrawn. But did they not even know the civil rights One question on this point. Just, just one question, Klaus. What do you make of Nixon's sentence, of his, this quote of his? I think it's in his memoirs or one of his book or interviews where he literally says, I could have gone out and withdrawn in 68. It would have been easy. These are his words. Mm -hmm. How do you understand this quote? Nixon always liked to say that some course of events that could have been done by him would have been easy, but he picked the hard choice. He loved saying that about various things. This was a, a characteristic and it's a, a quirk of Nixon's. It's not actually true, I think. I, I think he loved to exaggerate the political courage involved in his actions. And it may be that now in retrospect, we recognize this was the wrong step to take, But I think in 1969, a fair judge of where American opinion was and where the United States was would have said, um, you know, yes, withdrawal, a slow withdrawal, some sort of negotiated settlement, some face saving agreement would have been favored by, by many Americans. But you had to get that. And Hanoi in 1969 was not willing to give that to Nixon. They still demanded an overthrow of the two government. They demanded much more than he felt he could politically carry. Um, and I think, I think Nixon, of course, then put it in those terms, but that was, it, it is it, it very characteristic of Nixon's style to put, put it in that manner. Mm -hmm. Any further answer, reply, Bernd? No? Okay, let's move on to uh, uh, another question by Pete. Riveting discussion. Uh, this is a question from Scott Schwartz, and he's curious as if Henry Kissinger ever commented about Otto, Otto Van Bismarck's methods in his foreign policy approach. Um, and if so, what did he think about them? And we'll offer this to Thomas or Bernd, the two biographers. Bismarck? Bismarck. Bismarck, okay. Uh, there is a a very keen observation of Kissinger's related to Bismarck, and this has nothing to do with the equilibrium of power and, uh, you know, great power politics, but with the policy of policy making, or politics of policy making. He attributes the ultimate wisdom to Bismarck in saying, beware of centralizing foreign policy and personalizing foreign policy because you run the risk that your successors uh, will not live up to this towering example of yours. Now, this is sort of a um, hilarious comment on his own way of operating. I mean, if, if there was someone with a, with, a, with a penchant for centralizing and personalizing foreign policy, it was Nixon and Kissinger. Uh, so, I, I, I take this quote and, and this observation on Bismarck uh, to make the point that Kissinger's writing, more often than not, does not necessarily reflect his policy. Yeah, I would agree completely. Um, but Kissinger did write quite a bit on Bismarck. And if he had not been National Security Advisor, he was supposedly going to do a complete a book on Bismarck. That was going to be one of his books. And he had an essay on, on Bismarck, a white revolutionary and all of this. So, uh, but I, I tend to agree with Barrett that his writings, while fascinating at times, often have nothing to do with his actual policy making. Mm -hmm. uh, let me bring in China. Um, Mark Kramer asked uh, a question regarding Barry Goldwater, who denounced Kissinger for having sacrificed Taiwan for, uh, for the so-called opening to China. And of course, uh, in the early 1970s, Taiwan wasn't a democracy itself, but it became a democracy while China, uh, mainland China, of course, has remained a dictatorship. So Mark asked, was Goldwater uh, right after all for denouncing uh, Kissinger regarding uh, sacrificing Taiwan for the opening to China? And that is a question for all of you, but let's start with uh, Barbara, who was the China expert. Well, I, I think that's really usefully combined with a question that Richard Chris asks about how different the situation looked in 2008 when the 
prospect that China could be, you know, becoming a sort of more market oriented uh, uh, um, liberal uh, society, that was more plausible then. And of course, you know, if we should, if we were to chart the divergence between Kissinger's perspective on China, which is that the U.S. has to accommodate to China's rise, um, with the general consensus in public opinion, you know, he would be very close in 2008 and of course very far from um, public opinion now when uh, China is clearly much more repressive and American public opinion is more hostile to China than it has been since, um, you know, since 1971. So, um, I guess my answer to Mark's question would be, it kind of depends on where you, your 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 the point at which you're looking back from, um, but my answer to to Richard Chris's question, which is about you know what wasn't Kissinger's position about China more plausible in 2008? The answer is yes, absolutely. But um, he's always had this position that um, you, you really shouldn't be pressuring China. Um, his he was quoted in 2011 as saying, we cannot solve all the problems of the world and the domestic structure of all the countries in the world. And of course, you know, this is a theme in his thinking that but, the US should, shouldn't interfere. But cutting links with Taiwan, diplomatic links with Taiwan was the right thing to do in the uh, early 1970s? Let me let the biographers jump in on that. That's something they've both covered. I'm trying to avoid the question, Tom. <laughs> oh, I think I, I think so um, because I think the the goal there was to bring China uh, in during the Cold War, and I think China's tilt against the Soviet Union um, in the latter 70s and then 80s was a part of the isolation of the Soviet Union that contributed to the end of the Cold War. And so um, as, as difficult, I, I, I think you could not necessarily have predicted that Taiwan would become the thriving democracy it did. Um, at the time, it would have, the, the, the argument that the United States should sacrifice for a, a, a repressive island dictatorship would have been a harder sell. And I think in that sense, the realpolitik is aligning with uh, China and using China as, a, as pressure on the Soviet Union um, and isolating the Soviet Union made, made much more sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, keeping uh, some tenuous links to China, including responsibility for its uh, defense and its military protection, of course, introduced that ambiguous position we have now. So should the links have been cut properly rather than kind of semi-cut in the early 1970s? What is your position here? Well, I would just say I think that's good because in a way, uh, it allows the United States to adapt to a different situation in which Taiwan is a worthy ally of the United States and the United States should protect it uh, from uh, the coercion from China. But that wasn't necessarily the case uh, early on. And I think uh, some flexibility and ambiguity in diplomacy is not a bad thing. Okay, Bant, would you like to come in? Yeah, I mean, this was in the early 70s. This, in my perspective, was the price he had to pay for going to China and building this American, uh, the Sino-American relationship. Uh, there is, if you read the records of his meeting with Chu and Lai, uh, Chu and Lai lectured him on, uh, on the issue of Taiwan and uh, literally said, if you do not agree, if you stick to your former policy, here's the door. Uh, uh, thank you, but no thank you uh, for any rapprochement. Uh, so, I mean, this was, he, he couldn't have his cake and eat it too. Right, uh, he he had to make this concession; otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go and have an, uh, another question, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, Imre Gunger from Charlotte, North Carolina, um, points out that Western public uh, opinion had already turned against America by the time that Kissinger had taken office, and that America's imperialist attitude at the time was no longer a secret. Um, and considering how ruthless the Soviet Union was in Hungary and Prague, can we really blame Kissinger for playing the game by its rules or for, or for responding in kind to the threats that, posed, that were posed toward America at the time? Um, this is probably best addressed by uh, Professor Greiner, but anyone can answer. <laughs> well, it, it depends uh, what kind of, of a part of the public you're talking about um, uh, in Europe at the time. 
I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about contemporaries, right? Um, a minority, an absolute minority, was taking what was was trying to exculpate the Soviets uh, for what they did in Hungary and uh, and, and, and Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia in '68. This was a tiny minority, uh, way 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 off the mark. A majority, even within the left, was very critical of the Soviet moves in Eastern Europe. No doubt about this. And they say, cited with the Americans in terms of Western values. The game changer, of course, was Vietnam. Because in the perspective of a younger generation at the time, students, but not only students, also Social Democratic Party uh, liberals, uh, the Vietnam War was an put a huge question mark behind the claim of defending human rights and democracy worldwide. And this, this critique could be maintained without, without papering over what the Soviets were doing in Eastern Europe. Um, yeah, basically this is, would be my answer dating back uh, to the late 60s and early 70s. Um, would you like to come in? Um, I would just say that I, I think to a certain extent, um, Kissinger did have a, a sense that the game of international politics is played fairly ruthlessly. Uh, the Soviet Union plays it fairly ruthlessly. Um, uh, there was, uh, there's a famous conversation or an interesting conversation he has with Brezhnev in 1972 where uh, he's trying to justify the American refusal to um, get out of Vietnam uh, in the midst of the Hanoi offensive that was uh, advancing at that time. And he says, sometimes states have to do this. And, uh, you, you know, you've had to do this. And he makes the, basically the implication, you did this in Czechoslovakia, of course, you, you went in. And so there is, there is something to that. And I, I take Barron's point. I, I just also think that uh, some of the image of the Vietnam War was also shaped by uh, uh, a very, a very uh, clever North Vietnamese media, uh, because we of course know that after North Vietnam conquered South Vietnam, it was it was not paradise. Uh, Three million people fled. Um, Cambodia, of course, under communist rule, led to a genocide. So it is not. It it, it uh, the United States may have been uh, uh, hopelessly uh, involved in terms of building a state in South Vietnam, but I. I think the critique of the United States as being as ruthless and imperialistic is one that needs to be uh, critiqued. Mm -hmm. There's a question by Jacob Matai to follow up on that, asking about uh, the bombing of Cambodia and Laos. How can that possibly be excused despite any notions about credibility or any other considerations which may or may not be uh, useful and uh, fruitful, but how can that bombing be uh, excused? Well, there were North Vietnamese troops in both countries. North Vietnam had substantial troops in Cambodia and Laos. And the bombing was targeting their use of those territories for military campaigns. No question that this, you know, this was a part of the war. Um, but uh, you, when you're fighting a war, the idea that you don't bomb enemy troops is probably not a wise way. I mean, and there were so many mistakes made in the fighting of the Vietnam War, but um, certainly uh, that uh, that wasn't uh, the reason for the bombing. Mm -hmm. Bernd, how do you but, see it? Uh, I, would, I would like to take uh, issue with that, with that remark of Tom's, because I think the bombing, especially not only of Cambodia, but of Laos, was way out of proportion. I mean, what happened in the plain of Charles between 1967 and 1969, uh, one year before Nixon and Kissinger came into office, and couple of months into their uh, office. This was way out of proportion and not only directed against military targets, not only against um, troop concentrations, uh, but literally an attempt to bomb the majority of the population out of their solidarity uh, with the Pati Lao or uh, with, the, with the Viet Cong in Vietnam. So from my- I don't agree, I don't agree. I, I think, uh, you know, that was, military targets with a central aim of the bombing in both Cambodia and Laos. Mm 
Well, they might have been the, the, the central target at the very beginning, but the way it was operated completely, uh, not only got out of hand, but I think at times it was done by design to demoralize, to demoralize the majority of the populace, including civilians, of course, and the major part of civilians, uh, to demoralize these uh, um, people uh, in order to, uh, to, to weaken the war effort of the enemy. And this is something which um, I take, take a strong issue with. Well, I think the, the, the primary, the primary reason, certainly in Cambodia, the primary reason was the extensive base camps of the North Vietnamese. Uh, Laos is, uh, you know, Laos, uh, I, you know, Laos was the a pathway to Vietnam of the North Vietnamese army. Um, uh, you know, that, that did, I'm sure, brought uh, a great deal of military uh, targeting, um, but I would need to uh, see the, uh, the documentation or proof that this was done simply for demoralization and not for military targeting. I haven't seen that. Well, that, yeah. Barbara, do you want to come in? No. <laughs> All right, uh, Pete, can we ask for the next question, please? And can I just briefly mention, we are, of course, running out of time, as always, but if our three P uh, speakers are a little, um, still have a little energy left, then I would be much obliged if we could answer some more questions. There are still plenty of questions waiting for us. Thank you very much. Pete, please. Yes, we have a question from... Beverly in Chalik, and she's curious as to how uh, Kissinger would evaluate Biden's performance currently uh, a little before his first 100 days. And we'll offer this to all three speakers because I'm sure you will have interesting insights into the question. Well, Kissinger was actually on a, a forum uh, about a week ago. Um, and uh, while he is very careful on what he says, um, uh, about foreign policy. The one area of criti criticism he did have um, was the uh, degree to which Biden is jumping toward getting back into the Iran agreement. Uh, Kissinger thinks the Abraham Accords and the development of ties between Israel and the Sunni uh, Arab countries is an important development in the Middle East and uh, thinks that the reversal of that uh, to uh, uh, go back into the Iranian accord would be a mistake. Uh, otherwise, um, he was quite cautious about what he had to say about China um, and Russia. Bound. It's guesswork. I mean, Tom has mentioned his major comment he's made so far on, on, on Biden's agenda. Uh, and anything else, it's, it's hard to tell. I think it's too early. It's too early into this new administration to make a small judgment. And Barbara, what about the remark about uh, a genocide in Xinjiang uh, regarding the Uyghurs? Uh, would that be something uh, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy uh, Kissinger is uh, rejecting, or have you heard that he agrees with that remark? Sorry, which remark? Uh, and the Biden administration, like uh, the Trump administration, of course, said uh, what is happening in Xinjiang uh, was a genocide. So, I mean, just based on his general philosophy, he would certainly, I think, consider that to be an unnecessary escalation of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I that think she's, yeah, she's right. Yeah. Uh, Barbara's right. He would not want, probably go that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Maybe, yeah. maybe including. Maybe I add this one, including this uh, remark of Biden's calling uh, Putin a killer. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not necessarily um, the kind of language probably Kissinger would have used. Barbara, in your article, you talk about Henry Kissinger, um, uh, an emotional statesman, about Kissinger's emotions. What do we know about his emotions? Can you say, tell us something more about that? So just briefly, the reason I, I was interested in that topic is because um, I, I, I well remember reading Walter Isaacson's biography of Kissinger when it came out in the early 1990s. And I was just amazed at the descriptions of Kissinger's emotionalism, the way he would get angry and throw things across the room. I had no idea people behaved that way. And I was really profoundly 
struck by this facet of Kissinger and the fact that it seemed to contradict this image that we have of him as this realist, right? This calculating, cold-hearted person who sort of, you know, calculates the national interest and acts without emotion. So um, you're picking up on some new his trends in history where people are looking much more at emotions and understanding that emotions are always intertwined with reasoning. Um, I sort of tried to unpack how Kissinger's emotions worked in particular ways in particular relationships. And I was focused in particular on the relationship that he had a very, very close relationship with the Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin, who, um, you know, he and Kissinger were, were very friendly. And um, I, I try to make an argument that that personal relationship affected the way Kissinger saw foreign policy. And this is also something I try to develop in a, a book I'm writing about Kissinger and Joe and Lai. Kissinger was, you know, as Tom points out in his book, uh, Kissinger was really uh, enamored of Zhou Enlai, really uh, thought he was an amazing intellectual thinker, um, brand strategist. He loved talking to Zhou Enlai. And I think, um, you know, Tom has pointed out that the relationship with China influenced Kissinger's stance on the Indo-Pakistani conflict. I think part of that has to do with Kissinger's emotions, his feelings about Zhou Enlai and China more generally. I think we are well aware of um, the prima donna nature of Kissinger's personality, that he can be extremely charming if he needs something, and he can be, let's say, the opposite if he really is in a bad mood and has a temper. But what about his feelings towards death and bombings and uh, other human rights debacles, which of course he is not always responsible for. But in general, do we know about that kind of, uh, that uh, part of his personality? Is uh, any information available on that? Well, I would agree with Baron that there is plenty of evidence that he was quite indifferent to the fate, to the suffering of people in the, the, the global South. Um, it's quite interesting to me that his tenure in office coincides with this rise in uh, sentiment among Americans that human rights have a place in American foreign policy. And actually his intense opposition to that in the Nixon years helped fuel this sentiment um, because he so adamantly opposed the idea that human rights had a place in foreign policy, uh, people Develop more of a sense that, um, especially in Congress, you know, they passed legislation inserting human rights uh, considerations into foreign policy. Kissinger did in 1976 become more, at least rhetorically receptive to the idea that human rights had a place in foreign policy, but I think his record uh, overall and, and his positions since then have suggested that he just does not think that America should be concerned with the internal affairs of other countries in general. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. I don't, I don't think that's a, an unusual view. I, you know, you see a lot of Americans. Look, uh, we had a president for four years who would say that oftentimes. <laughs> so it is not uh, um, as, as much as it may seem like this is a trend in the world. And certainly Europe uh, is very fond of, of, of talking about that, not necessarily always acting in that way. But certainly, um, that certainly not a, a human rights is still uh, the issue of how much you try to affect the internal affairs of another country is still one that's really quite complicated for foreign policy analysts and for practitioners. Yes. Bernd, do you want to comment on this one as well? Well, I agree uh, with Tom's point uh, when it relates, for example, to the issue of internal affairs of the Soviet Union or China or whatever, where he made this case, it's not our business to interfere. Uh, but human rights, of course, also has this double-sided uh, image, uh, which Barbara was uh, referring to. Uh, he had a fairly detached um, to put it mildly, uh, attitude uh, towards um, the victims of war, the victims of repression, and for that matter, people suffering from uh, uh, American foreign policy, which again uh, is, uh, yeah, is part of the equation and should be taken into con consideration when we talk about human rights. Mm 
Thank you. Maybe we take two more questions and then I'll have some uh, couple of minutes for a final statement by our uh, great speakers tonight. Uh, Pete, would you answer the next question? Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, <clears throat> is it, we, this is a question from Brian Keela. And would it be fair to characterize Kissinger as a Machiavellian uh, type of politician? Is that fair or is that unfair? And we'll offer this to Tom. He seemed to have a reaction as soon as I said Machiavelli. Yeah, I, I think Machiavelli uh, is probably a kind way of sometimes talking about Kissinger. Um, he certainly had Machiavellian characteristics. Um, certainly, I, I would put some of those in terms of his bureaucratic maneuvering inside the Nixon White House and the ways in which he undermined Secretary of State Rogers. He could be quite Machiavellian and um, some of the ways in which he tried to secure policy outcomes that he favored. So yes, I think that's a fair assessment that he certainly had uh, sort of a Machiavellian tendency and could be, could be quite uh, 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 duplicitous in how he um, handled foreign policy and uh, bureaucratic issues within the, in, in the fight to determine foreign policy. And Kissinger would probably take it as a compliment to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Bernd. I, I would, yes, yes, Machiavellian at times. I would qualify a good deal of his foreign policy as double dealing. And this is a fair, fairly harsh criticism, but I stick to it, that he violated but you might claim a diplomacy 101 principle. Never delude party A by pretending to defend their interest vis-a-vis -vis party B while telling party B the exact opposite. Because there might be a time when party A and party B exchange notes and talk to each other about their experience with the American Secretary of State. This happened in the Near East. And this sort of double dealing was detrimental to his um, policy design and uh, undermined um, progress he had made in the first place in the long run. So um, I think this, this double dealing was not to his advantage. He never got rid of it. Uh, he, he, kept on violating another principle of 101 diplomacy. Uh, what is said in public must not be contradicted uh, behind closed doors. And You don't really believe that, do you? Pardon? You don't really believe that, do you? Well, there is a fair, if you read, if you read the history of German Ostpolitik. <sighs> yeah, of, of Willy Brandt and Genscher, and including Genscher. Whether you agree with their policy or not is not the issue. But the point is that their public stance covered what they said in private. And they never fooled their diplomatic partners. And they never talked behind their backs to a different party differently. So oh, I, I, Barrett, I can't buy it. I'm sorry. Uh, I've been too much of a historian to see what people said behind closed doors and then what they were saying publicly to believe any of that. I mean, I, I, I defer to you on Ostpolitik, but I'm sorry. That's, it's what a classic 101 of American politics is the tendency to say one thing in public and do another in private. But this was by, by way of illustrating what I, what, what I was saying at the very beginning. Party A and Party B. You can't make promises to Party E, uh, Party A, and when you are in a negotiating process, and tell Party B the reverse. Not the reverse, but you can. You can. What Kissinger did often was frame things differently when he was talking to the Syrians versus when he was talking to the Israelis, and the fact that the agreements came about would seem to indicate that you can do that. So I, I'm, I, I, do, I know Kissinger's tendency to lie uh, very cleverly at times, but he also managed to also succeed. So it's not, it's, I, I, I would disagree with you that he uh, necessarily uh, uh, was always violated that because uh, he did manage to, to get agreements. 
Well, I wasn't saying he was always doing this, but at critical junctures, uh, he, this way of double dealing, of playing to different sides of his audience, was detrimental uh, to a, a uh, to creating a solid, profound foundation for a policy lasting for a longer time. It was it was at times a bombshell diplomacy lasting for the day, but not for the long duration. Perhaps, perhaps, but I just, I just think it's also politics 101, and it, it does actually reflect on how things actually happen versus how we might want to believe they should happen. Let me bring in Barbara. Barbara, Kissinger as a Machiavellian? Or not? I mean, basically, yes. I mean, I, I think I, I would agree with what Baron said what, about how he has this, um, you know, sort of instrumental view about um, conducting foreign policy in a way that doesn't necessarily take into account, um, especially the, the the perspectives and the desires of people in the in the global south, and um, and a view that people will get trampled. And I think you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm recalling Neil Ferguson's book. Um, the first volume on Kissinger and, and how um, he sort of sets up the, the idea that I think he's going to uh, play up in the second volume, which is that e eggs get broken when you make omelets. All right. That's, Thank you. Yeah, that's Kissinger's view. <laughs> Thank you. Anna, let's go to the very final question. Thank you, Professor. Um, so this is for any of the speakers. Um, we may want to start with Professor Keyes, though, because um, it does relate to China specifically. Um, but the question is, would it be fair to say that since 1976, Kissinger has leveraged his China connections to advance his own personal interests and those of the United States corporate class, um, but not so much those uh, for the cause of fair wages and manufacturing employment in the United States? Yeah. So I'll, I'll just be very short and say that um, you know, since the 1970s, neoliberalism has been on the ascendancy and Kissinger's general position has been very much about promoting a neoliberal kind of agenda. So, yes. Thank you. That was a good, concise answer. Uh, Bernd, would you like to comment on that too? I, I agree completely with what, with what uh, Barbara just said. This was, of course, the criticism Bernie Sanders had of, of Kissinger when he was in the debate with Hillary Clinton when she said she had talked to uh, to to, um, uh, to Henry Kissinger and he said, "Well, yeah, look, Henry Kissinger was believed in the domino theory, got us into Vietnam, and and now he's uh, sending our jobs over to China." Effectively, of course, what Kissinger represented was, of course, a broad consensus within the American elite of uh, of of bringing China into the system. And a willingness, of course, to sacrifice or to see uh, uh, some American industries be affected by that because of that. So I, I do think, uh, you know, Kissinger played a role, but uh, he was hardly alone in the idea that China should be economically integrated into the global capitalist order. Thank you very much. Let me ask finally. Um, and considering that we, uh, 50 years after uh, Kissinger was Secretary of State, we are still talking about him, which testifies to his importance. So Tom, why do you think Kissinger was important? Was it a positive importance? Was it a negative importance? Or do we simply overrate the man? <laughs> You're asking someone who just wrote a biography to say that it was overrated and you shouldn't buy that biography, so I won't go there. Let me just say, look, I, I think he was involved at a moment in American foreign policy that was quite important and that had, there were a lot of changes going on. It was a retrenchment of American power that's not unlike what's been going on in the United States more recently. It involved um, a globalization of American foreign policy uh, in all sorts of places. It involved new questions of human rights. It involved um, uh, uh, this attempt to uh, deal with great power diplomacy um, in a manner that was very different from American traditions. And the fact that Kissinger is probably, as I say in my book, one of the greatest self-promoters in American history. And in a way, he also centered all of this on him and we keep talking about him. And he made a, uh, the career that Barbara is investigating and that I wish, I, I hope for the best that she can get at some of these issues because it's important. But he's had such an extensive and lengthy career. So we are still talking about it. But yeah, I think he was, he was a, at a important moment in American history that still is part of our, 
ongoing question of what type of foreign policy we want and what type of uh, ways it's made and set by American politics and American thinking on foreign policy. And of course, one point, like Churchill, he has written his massive memoirs, so he actually shaped history, how we talk about him, by writing it himself and still contributing. So we are deeply influenced how Kissinger views Kissinger, and I think to get rid of that and to overcome that, that will probably take us quite a few years. Uh, Bernd Greiner, how important was Kissinger or wasn't he important at all? Well, I would add one more, one more idea to what uh, Tom said, pick up on his observation. And the observation is it always takes two to tango. Um, here is Kissinger trying to be the impresario of himself. Uh, this, this really gifted storyteller a man who, who plays journalists like a flute. But it also takes a receptive audience. And I think the crucial question we should ask ourselves is, why was it that the American, uh, that parts, important parts of the American public were so receptive to Kissinger's message in the 1970s. How, how, how do we explain this? How can we make sense of his success? I mean, you can dramatize your own persona on end. If there's no receptive audience, you know, it's, it's good for nothing. So the, import, the, the really important question is, and I do not have a, a, a one line answer to this, the really important question is, what accounts for his public image? Um, of course, I mentioned it earlier, it's got a lot to do with a Prince of Darkness called Richard Nixon. Uh, you, had to, you had to have this, this luminous figure juxtaposed against Nixon. Maybe it has to do with the fact that he reinvented in his own way an American success story. Here you have a major world power in crisis. And here you have a mastermind who tells you how to get out of it for whatever it was worth. But I think this touched a nerve in the American public Plus in the 80s, you had this, this would be my third and final observation. You had this birth of celebrity culture, mm -hmm. which was not the case in the 50s. Maybe it started with the Kennedys, but it, in its prime was the 80s. And, and, and Kissinger, he, he had it in his fingertips, how to make the, the most of this celebrity turn. So we might add, further additional observations, but I think that's the crucial point. Why is the public so receptive? Thank you. I just noticed the viewer called Henry who joined us at the beginning has in the meantime left us. Maybe Kissinger has had <laughs> enough of our discussion. <laughs> Barbara, can I ask you too, what uh, do we make of Kissinger? How important was he or was he not important at all? Well, I think his importance has been inflated. I think Tom is absolutely right that he was a brilliant self-promoter. I think Barron is absolutely right that there's something about the receptiveness of the audience that has allowed that self-promotion to be successful. But I want to I want to end with something a little bit different, and I want to make a claim that Kissinger is far less controversial, especially today, than we make him out to be. And I'll just read you a couple of, um, of these new centers. There's a Henry Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at Johns Hopkins. There's a Henry Kissinger Distinguished Professor there. There's a Kissinger Summer School. Yale has Kissinger Visiting Scholars. The Woodrow Wilson International Center has a Kissinger Institute on China. The Library of Congress has a Henry Kissinger Program in Foreign Policy and International Relations with a Kissinger Chair and a Kissinger Lecturer. This is not an indication of someone who is deeply controversial. I mean, there are controversies around him. Uh, there's a cohort of academics who, um, you know, Greg Grandin has published a very uh, critical book uh, recently, but by and large, 
I think we've come around full circle in many ways. And, and this is a bit complicated because of his, his position on China now being so discordant with American opinion now. But in general, I think Kissinger is very much at the, you know, sort of highly respected top of his game now uh, in many respects, very similar to the early 1970s. But who knows how the future will judge him, how uh, historians in 50 years will judge. For the time being, we are very grateful to have these very valuable books by Tom Schwartz and Bernd Greiner, who will judge, who are, who are judging Kissinger as he uh, is seen now and uh, uh, on the basis of his career as Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. And Barbara has enlightened us about uh, his career since. Uh, he was active in politics. So thank you very much for all our three excellent speakers. It has been a great pleasure to discuss the role and importance of Henry Kissinger with you. Thank you to Anna and to Pete for helping us along so well. And our next Krasno event will be on the 15th of April, when we will talk about something very different, but also about geopolitics. We will talk about the Quad. That is that uh, new kind of four uh, nation uh, collaboration between Australia, the United States, India and Japan. And the question is, is that a pillar of stability or is it meant to contain China? More about the Quad in kind of three weeks time. Until then, good night to everyone. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you again for, audi for our, to our audience. Half of our audience is still here well over two hours after we began. We also, I have to say that we had many international viewers tonight, many from Germany, many from the UK, uh, also a person from a friend of mine from Dubai and uh, some other countries around the world. So that is pretty good. And I'm very proud of that, that we can attract so many interesting people to uh, view us here and even more interesting people to talk to us tonight. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Bernd. Thank you uh, very much, Barbara Keith. Good night. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Anna, and Pete. Thanks, Bernd. Thank you.